today we're going to discuss you know, one of the most fundamental aspects of using the program, and that's creating and processing a tax return with Crosslink 1040. Specifically, we're going to learn how to add a new tax return and discuss some of the important areas found within a tax return. We'll also learn how to complete the client data worksheet, how to add federal and state forms. After that, we're going to select the refund disbursement method. In other words, how the taxpayer would like to receive their tax refund. We'll see how to verify for tax errors, how to print and or archive, and how to capture signatures as well. Uh, I'll discuss how to queue and transmit the tax return and the difference between these two functions. And finally, we'll finish up with a few helpful tools to keep in mind when preparing tax returns. Tools to help you add notes, for example, check the current status of a tax return, register payments, uh, and much more. As you can see, we have lots to cover today, so uh, let's get right to it. I'm going to open up the program. Here we are. So this is the work in progress summary, the main page of Crosslink 1040. To add a new tax return to this program, what I'll do is I'll click on the Add New button found on the toolbar here. The first thing that the program wants from me is the taxpayer social. Now, if the taxpayer doesn't have an SSN and would like to apply for an ITIN, for example, what you can do is you can click on this W7 button found here. Clicking on the W7 button will create a return that's composed of all nines. The social of that tax return will be, create, will be composed of all nines uh, when it comes to the digits. But when you print out that return, um, that field that would display, well, let me show it to you actually. There we are right there. As you can see, it's com completely comprised of all nines. Um, but when you print out the return, when you enter the information and you print it out, this field will appear blank. Um, same thing with the spouse or the, or the dependents, for example. If the spouse had to apply for an ITIN as well, you can just start the social with five nines, and then the rest of the digits can be really whatever you want, just four uh, miscellaneous or random numbers. And that'll kind of classify or configure this person as, as being a, a person that's applying for an ITIN. So when you print out this return, it'll appear blank. Well, let me close this return for now. Now what I'll do is I'll begin a new return, and I'll just enter the social manually. Now something new for this year, as you can see, is that when you type in the social, it can be masked. It can be hidden by these little asterisks or stars. That's a new feature for the program. Um, so if you're interested in doing that and hiding the SSN as you type it in here, you can do so by clicking on Setup, Office Setup, and then under this Defaults tab, we have this Blind Entry for Add New Return. Selecting that box will enable, will enable this uh, function. I'll enter in that social again real quick. I'll click on OK to open up the return. And as you can see, the program is taking me to the client data screen. This is where we're going to capture all the taxpayer, spouse, and dependent information. Now, before we get into entering information, I just want to mention a few areas here, kind of give you the lay of the land when it comes to a new tax return in Crosslink 40. First of all, near the very top, we still have access to our tabs. So if we wanted to jump to the business returns package of the program in order to create corporate returns, we can do so by clicking on this tab. One of the good things is you can switch back and forth without, with, while leaving the tax return open. Um, so if you needed to compare information between uh, a corporate return and a 1040 return, you can do so by just clicking on the tab. Same thing with our website. You can click on the website tab to go straight to crosslinktax.com. Now the menu, we do have access to database and setup, for example, which we had access while we were outside of the, of the return. But we also have some new options available to us. We have the return menu, for example, which allows us to create a tax estimate by clicking on this tax estimator tool. Uh, you can also delete the tax return. If you want to get rid of a return, you can click on this delete return option to do so. Or, for example, you can lock and unlock the, lock or unlock the tax return. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of this, when you transmit a return, like when you e-file a tax return to the IRS, typically that tax return is going to be is going to have a lock placed on it automatically. As soon as you mark to transmit that return, we're going to lock that tax return to prevent any further changes 
from happening to that tax return. Of course, in some cases, you may need to um, you may need, may need to make an amendment, make a correction, and you can do so by coming opening up that return again and then just choosing the lock unlock option to toggle between those two options. For example, right now it's locked, and if I try to do something, the program will not allow me to do will type anything. It tells me that the tax return is locked, but you can come in and unlock that return if you do need to make changes. Along with the return menu, we also have the form menu, which allows you to access certain forms within the program, and the print menu that not only allows you to print the final tax return, which is basically the same thing as clicking on this print button. This allows you to print the final tax return. But along with that, you could also print the current form if you just wanted to print the form that you're currently looking at, or the bank documents if the taxpayer is applying for a, uh, a bank product. If they're going to be selecting a bank product as their refund disbursement method, uh, you'd want to print out those bank documents as well. Now, below the menu bar, you'll notice that we have a whole bunch of other tools available to us on the toolbar that have been added. These will be helpful as we go along entering information and processing a tax return. Below that, you'll see that the taxpayer's name will pop up. Obviously, I haven't entered anything just yet, so that's why it's blank at the moment. We also have the taxpayer's SSN that appears near the middle of this black bar. And to the right, we have the date in this return was created. Now to the left, we have the attached forms pane. This will display all the forms that are currently attached to the return. Now, underneath this general section, these are all forms that we've added. These are all basically crosslink forms, forms that will help you with the preparation of the tax return. Below that, we have the federal and the federal tax forms that we've added to the return. It automatically includes the 1040 and the 8879. Those pop up automatically as soon as you create a new return. And then if we were to add any states, for example, I'll just add one real quick so you can see how this, uh, how this information is organized. Let me add Oregon. There we go. So there's our federal forms underneath the federal section, and Oregon I, that I just added has the Oregon forms below that. Naturally, if you want to jump to a particular form, you can just double click on the form. It takes you right there. You could also delete any form by right clicking on it and choosing either remove form, or in the case of the states, you can right click on the state itself and choose remove state if you wanted to get rid of a, a state that you've added accidentally or that you no longer need. All right, now one last area that I wanted to mention when it comes to the different areas within a return is this active option window, or act, uh, what we call the active options down below here, this little gray area. The importance of this area is that whatever fields you click on, uh, if I click on, for example, the name here, down below it tells me what exactly I should be typing in this particular field. So this is basically line-by-line line help uh, for any field within Crosslink. If you don't know exactly what you should be typing in in a particular field, just click on it, and down below it's going to tell you. Very useful if you're new to Crosslink or if you're new to, uh, in, if you're new to tax preparation in general. This can be a very helpful area in helping you complete that tax return. Now, along with the line-by-line line help that's provided, we also have these buttons that appear. And these buttons will appear depending on what field you're on. Some of, in some cases, they may not apply. Like in the case of the home phone, um, I don't have any of these options available to me. But as we go through the return, we'll see that these buttons will become illuminated for certain areas, and I'll describe what those buttons do as we work with the return. All right, so let's get to it. Here we are on the client data. As I mentioned, this is where we capture all the basic taxpayer, spouse, and dependent info. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm just going to start entering information for this taxpayer, their name, their occupation. Now here, I'll take a brief moment to explain the Choices button, because this is the first field that we see where we have Choices enabled for us. Now Choices is basically just a shortcut for a list, a list that would apply, a list of options that would apply for this uh, particular uh, form or field that we're on. 
In the case of occupations, if I click on choices, it gives me a list of occupations. Now this list, I can modify it if I wanted to. And we provide you with a list of, of uh, kind of like various occupations, but obviously this isn't the full list of occupations that could exist. Uh, if you wanted to add an occupation to this list, what you can do is you can go to the database menu all the way to the top left. And then here, this is where you'll find all the lists for the choices buttons um, throughout the tax program. This is where you can come and modify those tax, those choices lists. In the case of the occupation field, we have an occupation area. You can click on that and notice that I've added these two occupations to that list. Teacher and fisherman weren't originally at, weren't uh, originally included on this list, but I've added them manually. So now I can I can select them, or I could even just type it in. I could begin to to type teacher, for example, and the program will want to complete the rest for me. So I definitely recommend if you cater to a certain type of customer, a certain type of occupation frequently, that you go into database, add that occupation to that database so that next time it's available by just typing in the first couple of, of letters. So now I'll move forward. I'll enter in some sort of phone number. In the case of the cell phone, that's very important for two reasons, actually. Uh, so I definitely want to enter a cell phone, and I'll explain the importance of that here in a few moments. Actually, let me enter in an email for this taxpayer as well. Here we are, very basic. Now, one of the reasons why you, want to might, you, might, you might want to capture the cell phone for a taxpayer is if you want to use the send text option, the text link option that's available in Crosslink 1040. This uh, text link feature will allow you to essentially send a text message to this taxpayer to their cell phone right through the program itself. And in order to do that, naturally you want you or you need their cell phone number. You also have to ask the taxpayer if they're willing to receive text messages from your office. If they are, you'll simply mark this with an X. That's all that that's all what this field represents. And then the last thing you need is their cell phone carrier. Since you're sending this text message through the internet, um, uh, we need to know where exactly are we going to send it to. Um, we need that address for that cell phone carrier. And thankfully, we have this choices list available as well that will display all the choices, all the different carriers that are available within the US. So you would just make the appropriate selection, click on OK. And now that I have these three pieces of information, I can click on send text and send any text messages that I want to this taxpayer regarding their tax return, their refund, their check being available. Um, it's, a very, it's a very useful tool for quick and easy communication. Now, I said that, I said that the cell phone uh, number has two things that can help you. One of them is the ability to send a text, a send a text message. The other one I'll, I'll talk about here in a few moments when we, uh, when we print the return. But for now, I'll move forward with entering information. Uh, new for this year, for 2016, for the 2016 program, we have the uh, entry for the driver's license or state-issued ID. Now the IRS would like to capture ID information for the taxpayer and spouse. So assuming that the taxpayer has that information, I'm just going to enter a number here, has their ID. I'm going to say they got it from Washington. It expires. 2016 pretty soon and it was issued in 2014. There we are. Now some folks have asked in the past whether or not we can use some sort of like passport information for this ID. And just note at the moment the IRS only requires or, or would only want uh, a state issued driver's license or a state issued ID. That's the information that they can cross reference uh, using their databases. Any type of passport information or, or things like that, those will not work at the moment. Now, below this, the taxpayer information, we have our filing status. And this is an area where you definitely need to look down below to see what exactly you should be entering in this field. If I take a look here, I can see that one represents single, two is married filing jointly, three married filing separate, and so on. 
Now for this example, I'll choose that this taxpayer is a number four, which means head of out of household. It's going to skip, uh, excuse me, it's going to skip the spouse information automatically and take me to the address information. Here I'll enter in the taxpayer's address. There we are. Below the address information, we have an area where, where we can capture the taxpayer's um, uh, combat information if they were involved in some sort of military conflict. We have that, those choices here available as well. So you could enter that information if appropriate. Below that, we have bank and routing number information. This is if the taxpayer wanted to do a direct debit or a direct deposit. Um, you could enter that information. You could enter their banking information in here. Now, one of the good things about this database, and notice that we have a choices button here as well. One of the good things about this area and a few other certain areas within Crosslink is that every time you enter a new bank name and a new uh, routing number, that information is automatically going to be saved to the database. It's not like the occupations one that we saw earlier. This one, if you wanted to add something, you have to go to database and manually add it to the occupations database. Bank uh, works a bit differently. The bank, that one will, will save that information automatically to this uh, routing bank and routing number database. So that next time, you can click on choices, and it will be there automatically for you. Uh, naturally, if you did want to enter information manually, if you wanted to enter some bank uh, names and routing numbers that you may have collected uh, for the season, um, or you, if you wanted to save those to the program, you can come in here and add that info manually. But otherwise, every time you enter in a new one, it'll save it to the, uh, to the database automatically. I'll enter in the account number and what type of account this is. And then below that, we have this client referral area. Now, this is typically optional. You don't necessarily have to use this field, but it's good if you want to track how the customer heard of your business. And just like these other fields that we've seen, we do have a Choices button available to us with certain um, options. And you could add additional ones, just like the Occupations database. You can add uh, other options using this Referrals area here. See, all these I've added manually. So if, you're, if you want to see you know, if a particular type of advertising, uh, advertising method is working for you, if you want to see how many, you know, if you went out and, and distributed all these flyers, and if you want to see if those flyers are working, this is a great way to track that information. And later on, you could run a report and see a breakdown of all this info of, you know, who, of what brought your customers to, to your business. Um, it's very useful if you did want to track that information. Now, below this client referral area, we have our health insurance questions. And actually, the first thing that we have is this um, um, option, this option to provide Call a Doctor Plus as a service. Now, Crosslink 1040, along with you know tax preparation, we also offer certain services, such as Call a Doctor Plus, which is is a sort of a virtual health service, where you know instead of the taxpayer having to visit a doctor physically at an, at their office, they could instead communicate with a doctor virtually via phone or the internet or a web video and things like that. Um, if they did want to subscribe to the service, um, or if you did want to subscribe to the service to be able to provide this service, you can do so by going to our website. There's information about that there. Or of course, you could talk to, account, to your account manager. Um, but for the cases of this example, what I'll do is I'll just say that, uh, that this taxpayer was not interested in using this virtual healthcare service. So I'll say that no, and no, and for no there. And then now here in this area, this is where we're actually going to start talking about health insurance and how the taxpayer received their health insurance last year. In the case of this taxpayer and in most of the taxpayers out there, it's typically going to be by the employer. If they received health insurance through their employer, then you simply just have to mark box A with an X. That'll take care of that. And then you can continue on with the tax return. Now, if you do have a taxpayer that purchased their health insurance through the marketplace, um, the option you'd want to select is letter D, purchase health insurance through the marketplace. And that typically means that they're going to receive a, a 1095A in the mail. If that's the case, you can click on this Quest uh, button, which stands for questionnaire, 
if I click on it, it's going to want to check this box automatically, this D box, and it'll take me to this ACA questionnaire where I can, depending on you know what the taxpayer did, when they purchased their health insurance and things like that, I can complete this form. And from the feedback we've received about this form, we've heard that it's fairly easy to use. Uh, I think it's been a, a hit overall with our tax repairs. But I'm going to go back. For this tax return, I'm just going to say that they purchased the, their health insurance through their employer, or they received it through their employer. And I'll move on to the next area. So below that, we have our dependents area. This is where we can capture all the dependents information. I'll enter in some info here for the dependent. Notice if I type in the first letter of the last name, it's going to want to complete the rest for me. I can just tab away to move forward. I'll enter in a birth date, an SSN, and the relationship. Here's the same thing. I can press S for son, D for daughter. I could also, since there is a Choices button available here, I can click on Choices and see what exactly all of the options that could apply for this particular field. I'll just say it's a son. And then here under MO, this is another field where if you're new to Crosslink, you may not know exactly what is required of you. But if you look down below, it tells you number of months dependent live with the taxpayer. And you could also press or enter CN for Canada or MX for a, a Mexican resident. In the case of this taxpayer, I'll just say that they lived the entire year, 12 months, with the taxpayer. All right. So now we have some codes that have popped up here automatically. If I take a look here, I can see that number one, uh, uh, down below, if it, says, it says press F3 for list of dependent codes. Now F3, the F3, F3 key on your keyboard is essentially the same thing as clicking on the choices button. It's just a shortcut. Open up this choices button. So I'll do that. And here we can see that number one, dependent live with a taxpayer. It's a pretty obvious assumption to make, especially since I ventured that they lived 12 months with the taxpayer. That's, that's why the program is making this assumption and is filling out these codes automatically, because it's taking the information I've entered so far into account and, and, and um, making some determinations. Like in the case of this E code, this means that they're eligible for EIC. And yes, according to the information I've entered so far, their, their birth date, their ISSN, and their relationship, this this dependent is eligible for EIC. After that, we have this X, which, which represents that they're eligible also for the child tax credit. So that's fine. Now this next field, this one wasn't filled out automatically for me. And that's because this has to do with Form 2441, Dependent Care. Since we're you know, talking about the dependent with the taxpayer at this point, this is kind of like the assumption that we're making, that right now we're capturing dependent information we figured it'd be a good time to talk about dependent care. And that's why we added this shortcut to add Form 2441 to the tax return um, by just pressing an X here. So at this point, you know, you would ask the taxpayer, did this dependent have any, any uh, dependent care? If they did, you could press X if it was just, you know, regular dependent care, or you could enter D as well if the dependent was disabled and needed uh, that type of care. Now, if I move away from this screen, or if I just refresh, just to manually show it to you, uh, now you can see that 2441 has been added to the tax return. So just consider this area as a shortcut to add Form 2441. Now the last field, this ST field, this only has to do with the Idaho grocery credit. Um, so if you do not live in Idaho or don't prepare returns for those that do live in Idaho, you don't necessarily, you don't have to worry about this, this field. This is only for that Idaho grocery credit. And there we go. So there we are. Now we have, on this client data screen, we have a taxpayer with some information, and we also have a dependent as well. Now before we move on, I also wanted to mention the use of these other buttons here. Because now, while we're looking at this dependence area, we now have the worksheets button available to us. And this is essentially a, a button to access the overflow worksheet. In the case of this dependence area, you can see that we have nine fields that we can click on, or nine fields that we can add dependence to. If, by chance, you had a, a taxpayer that needs or that has more than nine dependents, you can click on this worksheets button and add the information here. Now you can see that you have much more spaces available 
for additional dependents. So that's what that worksheets button is all about. It's just an overflow area. Now, the last button, this form links button, this, uh, we have to find a field where this button becomes activated. And one such field is on the 1040. We go to line nine, excuse me, line seven. Now you can see we have form links available to us. And this, as you can see, is just to, it is basically a link or a, the ability to jump to a, 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 to a form that's associated with the field that you're on. In the case of line seven, this has to do with wages, salaries, and tips. So if I click on form links, guess where it's going to take me? To the W-2. Very, uh, very straightforward. It just takes you to the field that is associated, excuse me, the form links button takes you to the form that is associated with the field that you're on. Okay? All right. So now let me go back to the client data screen. I'll reset here. Uh, we've completed all the necessary information. So what happens at this point? At this point, what typically happens next is you start adding the forms that you need to add in order to complete this return. Uh, now to do that, it's very simple. You just click on the Add Form button that's on the toolbar here. And you can notice once, once I hover my mouse over this button, it tells you what the keyboard shortcut is. In the case of Add New Form, it is Control A. So I'll click on Add Form or you can press Control A. Either way, it'll show you this screen or this window. This is where it'll provide a list of all the federal forms I can attach to this return. At first, it's organized kind of like by importance. The 1040 W-2, as a matter of fact, it automatically highlights the W-2 because that's a pretty important form. But after that, it gets into alphabetical order and then numerical order. So you can just scroll, uh, scroll through this list using your mouse, such as I'm doing right now. You can, you can even jump to a particular form by using your keyboard. For example, I can press C for Schedule C, D for Schedule D, 1099. I could just go straight there using my keyboard. Now, if you don't know the exact number or letter of a form, one of the things that we have is this index tab. This index will provide me a very, you know, it basically provides me the same list of forms, but now they're organized by the description of the form instead. So instead of having to search for a specific letter or number associated with the form, now I can search for description, such as education, for example, or Social Security. That will allow you to find a form if you don't ignore the exact name or number of that form. Very useful for, for new tax preparers that don't have much tax prep experience. Now, I already gave you a preview of adding states. But just to show you again, you do it to add a state to a tax return, you just click on the state form. Here is where you select all the available states. We have them all included in the program. Well, at the moment, uh, at this moment right now, some of these states won't, won't be available because they're still working on it, such as, such as the case of California, for example. Uh, but as, the, as we go along through the season and you transmit with the program to pick up any updates, um, those states will be added automatically to the program. Um, all right, so I've added a W-2 already. This was added by when I clicked on the Form Links button. So I'll just use this W-2, and I'll insert some information for this taxpayer regarding wages. Uh, so here we are on, on box one. I'll enter in some wages. I'll say they've made a, a cool 50K withholding of 45. We also need to enter the employer identification number. Now, this is another field just like the bank. Every time you enter in a new EIN and a new employer name and address, that information is going to be saved automatically to the database. Just like any of these databases here, you can add the information manually. That's the employers and payers one. That's the EIN database. As you can see, I've, I have plenty here. And these were all captured while I've, been, while I've been preparing returns. So every time I enter in a new one, it'll save it to the program. So that next time, I can click on Choices, and there they all are right there. So I'll choose, let's say, Finn's Gym. There we are. I'll enter in California. And I'm, I'm just basically entering some gibberish here just to fill this out. There we are. Now, as far as the, um, the process goes, again, we start at the client data. 
enter this information with as much info as we can. The importance of this client data is that all the info that you enter here is going to flow to all the forms that you add later on to the tax return. And that's what the next step is. You add the forms that you need to add in order to complete this tax return. Now, assuming that you've added all the forms and you've um, you know, entered those forms with all the appropriate information, to select the refund disbursement method, you want to do that on the 8879. Uh, here on the 8879, at the very top, this is where you can select the refund type, how the taxpayer wants to get their refund. Now, uh, when I'm, since I'm on this box, down below it's going to tell me, it's going to give me a breakdown of what each number represents, what each selection represents, and it also tells me that same information here um, at the very top. One would be a regular check from the IRS. This is a mailed check directly from the IRS. Two is a direct deposit from the IRS. Now, if the taxpayer wants to do a bank product, if they want to receive their refund using a bank product, using, you know, TPG or Refundo or Refund Advantage, um, so there's, you, you, the option you'd want to select is five, RT or refund transfer from the bank. Once you do this, so let me see if this works here. Uh, no. Unfortunately, this program isn't activated to, to provide bank products. But in your case, if you've, been, if you've been approved by the bank, and I definitely recommend if you haven't applied with the bank yet using our website, you definitely want to start that process um, of enrolling with the bank through our, our online portal, through crosslinktax.com. And once you do that and select number five here, a bank application will be automatically added to the tax return. Uh, and that is where, on the bank application itself, that's where you can select whether or not or how the taxpayer wants to get this bank product. So if they want to get a direct deposit, for example, of the bank product refund, uh, on the bank application itself, that's where you're going to make the selection that they want a direct deposit of that bank product. Or other examples include a regular check that you're going to print out at the office or uh, a cash card. Those are all different ways of providing that refund of the bank product to that taxpayer. So just be aware. Enter number five here on the 8879 if you do want to select bank product. And then on the bank application, which will be added to the return, assuming that you've been approved by the bank and all that, all that uh, is automatically downloaded into, the, into your program. And on the bank application itself, that's where you can make the modifications of how exactly the taxpayer wants to get that, that refund. All right. Now, the next step, once you've added the forms, entered all the information that you want on the forms and selected how the taxpayer wants to get their refund, what typically happens next is you're really getting to the point of finalizing this return. You are basically want to verify the return to see if there's any errors. Before you transmit, you want to check if there's, any, if there's any errors that will cause a rejection. So to do that, you'll click on the Verify button that's on the toolbar. Or, as you can see here, you can press Control-V on the toolbar. I'll click on verify, and notice that I have all these errors that I have to fix. And that's because you know I've barely completed this return. I've just added forms and entered some basic information, but there's lots of missing information, as you can see here. But what I wanted to point out is that if um, you need to fix any of these errors, you can just double click on the error itself, and it takes you to the area where you need to apply or fix uh, um, uh, the error. It takes you right to the form and field that contains that error. Same thing with all those other areas that pop that pop up in this and on that uh, verify window. I can just select, make the correction, press enter or tab to go to the next error, and then press enter again, enter the information. Actually, I'll change that to paper pair. There we go. And essentially, just go through this list, fill out everything that's required under that verification window. Now, for this example, I'm not going to go through the trouble of clearing out all those errors. Instead, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to close this return, and I'm going to look up a customer that I know is ready to go. I think this Marvin Martin is the key. If I click on Verify here, this is what you want to see. That the tax return no longer has any errors, and you're now ready to, you're now ready to print and transmit that tax return. So let's do that now. I'll click on the print button that's on the toolbar. This will print the final tax return. 
And once I click on that print button, this window pops up. And here I have some options. I, I don't have to send it to the printer right away. I can if I click on this print button. That will just print out the copy of the return. But other than that, I do have some options. For example, I have the sign doc button option, which will allow me to capture the taxpayer's signature if I have an electronic signature pad uh, at my office. Um, if I do have one of those electronic signature pads connected to my computer, I can use that signature pad to capture the taxpayer's uh, signature. Now, new for 2016 is this remote sign, and this is very interesting. Uh, I mentioned previously that there's two important things or two benefits to capturing the cell phone information. One of the benefits was being able to send a text. The other benefit is being able to uh, capture the signature remotely, especially if the taxpayer has a smartphone. Uh, what I could do is I can click on this remote sign button, and what will happen is, is it will send a text message, uh, a link basically, via text message to whatever cell phone message, to, to whatever cell phone you have in here. That link will allow the taxpayer to sign using their cell phone, using their, smart mo their smartphone specifically, um, for this tax return. And then once they sign and, and submit that signature that they, you know, that they basically sign on their cell phone, it would come back and it would automatically populate in the return that's in the, in the program itself. It's a pretty nifty, I have to say, pretty useful tool especially if you don't have a signature pad yet. If you haven't invested in a signature pad for your office, you can, you can just use this sign. And one of the good things as well about this remote sign is that the taxpayer, or I should say, let's say the spouse, if the spouse isn't at the office at that moment and we just have the taxpayer, you can send a remote sign to that spouse's cell phone. And they could then review that return. They'll receive, along with the, with the area to capture their signature, They'll, they'll also have a PDF of the tax return that they can review, make sure everything is correct, and then sign for that, for that tax return. And again, once they sign on their phone, it'll pop in the return automatically. Pretty nifty. Uh, you could also, if you'd like, email a copy of this tax return directly to the taxpayer. Uh, it'll send an email, uh, it'll send this tax return to whichever email you've entered here. Why, if you do want to start sending emails, of, uh, or you want to send copies of your taxpayers' refunds um, or returns directly to their email, make sure to capture their email address here on the client data to do so. Um, actually, let me click on that because I want to show you that when you do email a, a, a tax return to the taxpayer, uh, one of the um, requirements that the IRS has is that the return has to be encrypted with a password. Um, and notice that it's created a password for me automatically. The program has automatically created a password for me. And the password is the first four letters of the last name and then the last four of the social. That's going to be the default password for every uh, email that you send with the tax, with the tax uh, return. That's how it's going to generate that password. Um, so if I click OK here, uh, I could then enter in a subject, a body, and I could also, if, if the taxpayer doesn't know exactly what their password should be, what their encryption password should be, you can click on this send attachment password, and what will happen is, is that we'll email the customer two things, two email messages, one including the password and a separate email with the PDF with uh, that, that they'll need the password to open up. All right. So I'll close that for now. Oh, actually, yeah, I'm going to capture the taxpayer's signature using, since I have a signature pad at my office, I'll just sign using the signature pad. Click Accept. Now the program is asking me for the paid preparer signature. Now this is something you can preload into the system so that you, as a paid preparer, never have to sign, really. You only sign once, and it's taken care of for the rest of the tax season. But for this example, I'll just enter it again and choose accept. And now, as we can see, a PDF has popped up of this tax return. If I scroll through this PDF of the return, there's my pay prepare signature that I've just captured. And, and uh, please be aware that this can be preloaded into the program so that um, you sign once at the beginning of the tax season, and that is it. You no longer have to sign again. There's my taxpayer signature. 
And another signature is the ERO signature. This is another one that you can preload into the program. See, it didn't ask for the ERO signature. It was just preloaded onto there. Now, one of the things that I've done is that I've created my office, or I've configured my office to be a paperless office, so that when I capture or when I print returns, it's not really printing them. It's sending them to the document archive instead. If I open up my, my, docu my document archive, I can see here are all the copies of these tax returns that I've created. Um, and I could always up, double click on this to view the return itself. Or, and if I need to, I can print it from here. I can email it. I can save it, whatever I need to do. But I prefer not having to waste you know, the paper and toner necessary uh, for keeping my copy of the return, the prepared copy. Instead, I just uh, store it as the doc. I just store it in the document archive um, for future use. And that's something you can do as well. If you go up, for example, to the setup menu and printer setup, this is where you can modify your printer settings. I'll click on the 1040 return printing tab. And this is where you can configure what exactly is going to be printed out when you do click on this print button. Notice that we have a prepare column, we have the client column representing the taxpayer's copy of the return, and in my case, I send them both to the archive. If I wanted to send the customer's copy to the printer, but my copy as, a, as the taxpayer to the archive, I can do this type of configuration. You see, it sends the client's copy to the printer, my copy to the archive. But in my case, I'm completely paperless. I'm just emailing uh, their their copies to them to the taxpayers. So I'm just storing everything in the archive, and I don't have to worry about any paper and toner costs anymore for my office. So now that I've you know quote unquote printed this return, we're now ready to transmit the tax return. I'll click on the Q button. What this Q button does is it basically gets the return ready to be e-filed. It wraps it all up so that it's waiting to be transmitted. Um, if I had any states attached to this return, those states will appear here listed out as well. Um, and I could, if I needed to, just like I can do with the federal, I can queue or not queue it. If I, if I wanted to just send the federal, I just have to make sure that it's checkmarked. If I had any states and I wanted to send those states, just make sure that all those are checkmarked as well. At this point, since I only have the federal to send or to queue, I'll just leave it checkmarked. And then down here at the very bottom right, I'll click on the Q button. Now, as you can see, the return is closed automatically. And if I check, it, if I check the status of this return, it says that the return has been queued. So it's waiting to be transmitted. Notice as well, if you see, and I know this is very small to see, but there's a little lock here. That's indicating that this return has been locked from, to prevent any further changes from happening to this return. That's because I queued it for transmission. The program is assuming that that return is done and there's no other changes that need, to be make, that need to be made to it. But remember that if you do need to make any changes to it, you could always unlock it using that uh, lock unlock option. But at this point, since it's queued, uh, if I have another customer waiting at my office, I can just go ahead and start a new return while leaving that queued and then prepare another tax return. Or if I wanted to transmit this return immediately, if I needed to send it right away, I can then click on the transmit button on the toolbar here. Notice that it tells me what exactly is going to be transmitted. One of the items that's going to be transmitted is a 1040 tax return. I can click on filter down below to, to see what exactly we're talking about. Uh, in the case, in this case, we're just talking about Marvin Martin's tax return. And I can even deselect it if I don't want to transmit it right away. But for my example, I'll just leave them selected. And then as soon as I click on this transmit button down here, that's when the return will be e-filed, when, it, when it'll be transmitted to our central site and then passed along to the IRS or any states. And there we are. That is the process of a tax return, the life of a tax return within CROSS and 1040. Now, before we wrap up here, I know we're, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to mention a few tools to keep in mind when you're using CROSS and 1040. First of all, you have this quick option. This allows you to verify the status of any return, the real-time status of a tax return. If I click on this, it'll ask me for the social. And then if I type a social here, let me, I have to type in a social that exists in the program, so let me try that again. 
There we go. I'll just use this uh, all nines one. Oops. Let me try that again. Actually, let me try this. 411-003-007. There we are. So now we can at least see the type of information you'll see when you click on this quick button. Uh, when I run this quick button, it does, it communicates instantaneously with our central site to see what the current status is. So you don't have to transmit or anything to pick up the, 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 the real-time status. Instead, this quick button does it automatically. So you can see what's going on with the return, if it's been acknowledged as of right now. If the customer has a bank product associated with it, you can check on the status of that as well. And one of the good things about this quick tool is that you can be inside a return. I can be, for example, working on Brian, Brian's return here. And then if another customer calls in and wants to check the status of their return, I can click on quick, enter their social, see what's going on with that return. And then once I'm done, I can close this and return to my original tax return. Keep working on the one that I was working originally. It's a very nice tool, very helpful when, it, when, you want, when you need to find out what's happening with a particular tax return. Other than that, note, note that we do have notes available. Um, if you need to add any notes to this tax return, you can click on notes. And this type of note that's on the toolbar here, this is nice because once you add one of these notes, um, that note will always appear right away. As soon as you open up the return, that's the very first thing that you're going to see when you open up the return is this note. It's going to pop up to remind you know, whomever is working on that tax return about anything in particular. So if, uh, for example, if the customer owes you money or something like that, if, it, if uh, you needed to add anything that you wanted to see immediately, um, that's what these notes are for. Uh, and one of the other good things about these notes is that they transfer year after year. So you can really keep track of a taxpayer and any type of information that you wanted to keep in mind about a particular taxpayer. This note is perfect for that. Now, in some cases, you may need to send a note to the IRS, any type of uh, some sort of ex um, explanation of something. We do have that note as well, but that is added through your add forms. If I click on add forms here, and then I go all the way to the bottom, here we have IRS notes. And notice that these, this form will be, will be included in the e-file. So anything that you enter in here will be sent to the IRS for any type of information. Now, another thing I should mention is this payments button. If the taxpayer isn't using a bank product and they're paying you directly cash or check for your tax preparation fees, this payments button is very good if you want to register that payment being made to your tax office. If I click on this, you'll notice that here I have the option to select how the taxpayer paid for their tax prep services, who received that payment, the amount of the payment, and so on. And just like quick, this option, if you click on it when you're in, in the return, that naturally applies to this tax return that you're in. But if you, you also have access to this payments button, if I get away from the return, on the work in progress, you have access to payments here as well. So if a customer comes in to your office and says, hey, I need to pay my bill, you can enter in their social and then um, add that payment quickly to the return without having to open up the return. 